What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack a Day Podcast. Today, we are going to talk about coaching and some of the issues that have existed with the coaching so far this season. And I think everyone's been talking about the issues with the offense and some of the personnel on offense, the defense, and some of the decisions and some of the players and the play, lack of playmaking on defense. Today, I, I don't want to go over the players. I want to go over what's been going on with the coaching and why up until this point, I don't think it's up to par. And I think it's fair to call that out. Not all that different from Aaron Rodgers yesterday. I think Aaron Rodgers is a phenomenal quarterback. I think he's going to go on to have a fantastic season. I think he's one of the best to ever do it, but I think he struggled through five weeks this season. And I think it's okay to say that. Like I said, I think he'll bounce back fine. He's Aaron freaking Rodgers. Matt LaFleur, same exact thing. I, I have nothing but the utmost of respect for Matt LaFleur. I think he's going to be continue to be a phenomenal coach. I think Green Bay hit an absolute home run with hiring him when they did. And I think he's going to have a very long and successful career in Green Bay. That's just my gut feel. That's, I don't know him. I've obviously asked a couple questions in press conferences, but I've never interviewed him, never had any, in, any interactions with him. But my honest to goodness gut feel is that I think he's a phenomenal coach and he is going to do fantastic things and has done fantastic things for this organization. But similar to Aaron Rodgers, I don't think it's been up to Matt LaFleur's standards and I don't think it's been up to this coaching staff standards as well. One of the things that I do want to mention is that today's episode is not about Rich Bisaccia. I think Rich Bisaccia has done nothing but a spectacular job so far this season. Is the special teams the creme de la creme of special teams? No, but they're not an unmitigated nightmare, and that is a step in the right direction. In fact, they've shown some pretty decent signs. And I've seen a couple people comment and post of like, you can't, you know, like Rich Bisaccia is getting too much credit. Look at Amari Rogers is still back at returner. That's not a Rich Bisaccia issue. That is a personnel issue. They don't have a good returner on this team that makes sense right now. And that's not on Rich Bisaccia. He's trying to do the best he can with the personnel that he is given. You, like I think making the move to Christian Watson at kick returner is the right move. We'll see if he can stay healthy and stay out there. I think they have a major issue at punt returner. You could put Romeo Dobbs out there, but do you really want to put him out there and risk injury to Dobbs? Plus he's hands, had some issues with his hands as well. I don't think you want, you know, 30 plus year old Randall Cobb back there. So that's not a Bisaccia issue. That is a personnel issue. And that's something that Brian Gutekinds will have to address. But today's episode, very clearly not about Bisaccia. I think he's done a tremendous job so far. That's not to say that there won't be some hiccups moving forward. I guarantee you there will be. This is a Packers special teams by all uh, accounts. And we know what that means. But as of right now, Bisaccia has done a fantastic job. So Let's talk about the other coaches, specifically Adam Stenovich. Let's talk about Matt LaFleur. Let's talk about Joe Barry. And let's talk about the position coaches because I think we can all argue that offensively and defensively, this has not been up to the standard that we expected going into this season. So one of the things with coaching is that it can be a little bit tough to decipher and it can be a little bit tough to call out at times. So we have to, I think, label exactly what we want to discuss when it comes to coaching, what the expectations are, and where I think we should start evaluating the coaches so far this season. So I look at scheme. I look at player development. I look at putting players in a position to succeed, game planning, learning from mistakes, responding to adversity, in-game adjustments, and overall mentality. Those are the eight categories that I'm going to be reviewing today and kind of discussing where I think things are lacking so far through five weeks in the season. So number one, I'm going to start out with scheme. So I'm a big believer, and this is sometimes easier said than done, but I'm a big believer that if you are a strong offensive-minded coach, you should have a few plays every single game that are going to be maybe not necessarily explosive. Like it doesn't have to be like an 80 yard touchdown, so to speak, but like plays that you have recognized that you know are going to work against the opposing defense. You've done your tape study, you've repped your team throughout the week, and you know when you get a certain look that you're going to be able to exploit it. I'm looking for three, four, five times per game that the offensive coach is just outsmarting the defensive coach, picking up on a tendency and tearing it apart. That's number one. And on the defensive side, what I'm looking for is 
can you scheme a free blitzer or two? Can you scheme a quarterback to become predictable and throw in a certain direction so maybe you can jump a route? Is there something that you've done as a defensive coordinator where you've done your homework and you've set up your scheme so that you can maybe get an explosive play or a sack or get off the field on an important down? So an example this past week on offense is the Mercedes Lewis touchdown, right? That is a beautifully drawn up play. It has the entire defense confused. And you look at that play from a personnel standpoint, watch the offensive line, watch Mercedes Lewis, watch Aaron Rodgers. Literally, I don't care who you are watching this. You could have been at quarterback. I probably could have been in Mercedes Lewis's shoes. And there's a real decent chance that we pulled off that play. Like that's how well schemed it was because everything's going in motion. The, the defense is just reacting and looking at everything. And by the time the quarterback, Aaron Rodgers in this case, turns around, Mercedes Lewis is wide open in the end zone and ball in hand. And the defense does not know what hit them. That is a phenomenal example of great scheming, great play calling, and preparing your players for that exact situation. Beautifully well done. That said, I haven't seen enough of that offensively this season. It's something we came accustomed to early in Matt LaFleur's career that I don't think we've seen enough of. Christian Watson play, opening play against Minnesota. That's another great example. They saw something on tape. They attacked it right away with Christian Watson. It didn't work, but that's a beautiful play, a beautiful play call by Matt LaFleur. They took advantage of something they saw on tape and they exploited it. A couple plays here and there that we've seen, but not enough through five games. That's number one. On the defensive side, if you want examples of this, all you have to do is go back to the Giants this week and see how many free rushers that Wink Martindale was able to scheme up against Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. And it should be noted that Aaron Rodgers, not an easy player generally to fool at the line of scrimmage. So the fact that Wink Martindale had a handful of plays at his disposal that he thought he could get free rushers on Aaron Rodgers in this Packers offense shows that he did the study, he picked up on something, and quite frankly, he outcoached the the Packers offense in those scenarios and got free blitzers to the quarterback. And on on numerous occasions, he was also able to dictate matchups, meaning he was able to get Dexter Lawrence one-on-one with Royce Newman. And some of those plays ended up costing Green Bay dearly. So That is exactly what I'm looking for from Joe Barry. We have seen extremely, extremely little of that so far. We have seen some times where Green Bay has been able to get favorable matchups for Rashawn Gary and Kenny Clark. That is absolutely true. But think think of the last time that you saw a Packer defender just come scot-free and like crush the quarterback because of something that the Packers did schematically. Maybe one or two times this season. Maybe I'm struggling personally to think of one off the top of my head. I know Preston Smith's had a couple plays where he came free. I believe, just thinking through it, that that was more of like offensive design to not block and get rid of the ball quickly. But overall, we've seen precious little of getting a free rusher, even trying to attempt to get a free rusher so far. And that's where things need to be better. Offense and defense, you you can't put the, the burden of everything on the players. Ben Fennell always talks about offense doesn't need to be so hard. Defense is sometimes the same thing. You can show different looks and do different things and just be confusing. The double A-gap blitz look is a fantastic one where, you know, you've got six guys up at the line of scrimmage. It's not perfect. There's counters to it as well, but like you could drop three guys, you could bring all six, you can do so many different things and they don't know which player is coming and it causes issues and it caused issues for Green Bay this past week, bringing a safety up to the line and standing right over the guard. Green Bay didn't have a great answer for it throughout the entirety of the game. So there needs to be more of that from Joe Barry and company. And Matt LaFleur in his press conference to his defense said like, hey, if we wanted to you know, get in some of the exotic stuff, we got to get into some of those third and long situations. He also mentioned they were worried about blitzing because if all of a sudden Saquon Barkley gets a draw or a screen or a, a trap play, something like that, he could be gone. So they were worried about that. But I think, as I've mentioned before, I think Green Bay was seeing ghosts a little bit in that game. I think you have to play your brand of football and and Green Bay's been a little bit trigger happy and shy and being a bit more aggressive. So I need to see some easier plays for this offense and for the defense to get things going when they need a boost, when they need a big play. And I haven't seen enough of that. So from a scheme standpoint, I think offensively, 
I think what Matt LaFleur wants to do in trying to pick apart mismatches and see what area of the field is the easiest to attack, I like the overarching philosophy. I like the overarching philosophy of Joe Barry and making sure that you're not giving up explosives and trying to keep safeties deep. But you really need to make sure that you're not becoming predictable, that you're making things easy for your defenders, and that your scheme is matching up or doing better than the scheme across from the field. And again, simply put, that has not been good enough through five games so far. I think you can make a strong argument that Minnesota game one, that certainly the Giants in game five, that Bill Belichick in game four, that at minimum, those three games that the Packers got just flat out outcoached in those three games. I think that is extremely fair to say. So that is something that needs to get cleaned up. Number two is player development. And what I'm more specifically looking at here, and one of the things that I think is ultra important when you're evaluating coaches is, all right, let's just set a baseline expectation going into the season of where you think players are at. If we were to take an honest look at things and say, like, completely honestly, who has overachieved so far this season? Who is a player that you think is above your expectations as you came into this season? I can, and again, we're not talking special teams here. So we're just talking offense and defense. I can think of two. I can think of two players that you can make an argument for. Romeo Dobbs, I think as a fourth round draft pick who has shown some serious signs of being a real legitimate wide receiver in this league and for this offense, I think you can make an argument that he is exceeding expectations at this point. And I think that's a fairly easy argument to make. I think Jerron Reed is having a very nice season so far. And I think you can make an argument specifically based on his contract and the tape that we saw over his, you know, what, four or five year career, I think five year career so far. I think you can make a serious argument that he is exceeding expectations so far. Wildly so, no, but I think he's exceeding expectations. I don't think there's anyone else on offense or defense that you could legitimately convince me of is far exceeding or even just exceeding the expectations that we would have had for, you know, for them going into the season. I think you can make an argument for another handful-ish of players who are at least meeting expectations. Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon, Alan Lazard, Randall Cobb, Mercedes Lewis, Preston Smith, Rashawn Gary, Kenny Clark. About eight players. I think you can make a strong argument that those eight players are at least meeting expectations. Solid. All right. But you can make a very strong argument that players like Aaron Rodgers, the entirety of the offensive line, um, Devondre Campbell, Razul Douglas, Adrian Amos, Darnell Savage, Jair Alexander, like the list is pretty exhaustive of players that are either below or even well below expectations so far this season. So if I'm weighing things out, I've got maybe two guys that are sort of exceeding expectations, and I've got a laundry list of players that are below expectations, some to a fairly significant, uh, you know, in a fairly significant way, I should say. So that is another sign to me that the coaches need to step up and make sure that they are getting the most out of these players. Number three on my list is putting players in a position to succeed. And what I mean by that is, and I've talked about it, Jair Alexander, one-on-one -on -one with a practice squad wide receiver. Now, every NFL player is a legitimate NFL player and you need to treat them with some level of respect and reverence. But if you line up Marcus Johnson versus Jair Alexander, one-on-one, -on -one, 99 or 100 times, 99 times you're going to feel extremely confident with Jair Alexander. And if Marcus Johnson, practice squad player picked up through the course of the week, beats you down the field and comes up with an explosive over Jair Alexander, tip your cap. And you know what? That's not on Joe Barry. That's not on Joe Barry at all. If if Joe Barry called press man coverage, Jair Alexander versus Marcus Johnson, every single play didn't change things up, I would say, you know what? That's fine. I don't have an issue with that. And if Jair gets beat a few times and Marcus Johnson beats the Packers because Jair couldn't cover it, that's on Jair. That's not on Joe Barry. On the flip side, if Jair is playing 14 yards off the line of scrimmage against him, a uh, practice squad player picked up throughout the week, and you're allowing, you know, eight yard, nine yard completions on second and 19. It was like a 13 yard completion on second and 19 to get into field goal range. That's on Joe Barry. That's not on Jair Alexander. Now, could have Alexander come up and made a better tackle? Yeah, he could have. But that overall is more on Joe Barry than it is on Jair Alexander. 
Same thing with utilizing Aaron Jones. That needs to be something where you put Aaron Jones in a position to succeed. It's tough to put Aaron Jones in a position to succeed if you don't get him the football. Better ways to utilize Christian Watson. I think there are ways that you can make him a bigger factor in this offense without having to rely so much on gadget plays. Listen, he is a work in progress at wide receiver. I get that. I understand it. You can see it on tape. He's not quite there yet. He's still learning. And the time that he missed in training camp has definitely been detrimental. But like Green Bay's defense can't cover a crossing route to save their lives. Can we try a crossing route with Christian Watson and his speed across the defense and maybe see if that would be something that could work? Even just a shallow cross. Like that used to be a staple of Matt LaFleur's offense is those bunch formations with a shallow cross or a slant underneath. Like he doesn't have to be a, a all pro wide receiver to run that. Like have him run that, run a couple picks for the guy, get the ball in his hands and let him do some of the heavy lifting. Like it, it just needs to be simpler in putting your, your, your players, your playmakers in a position to succeed. I'm not sold that Darnell Savage is in his best position. I definitely believe it's safety, but I don't think the too high safety is playing to his, his skill set. I think he needs to be more in that robber role that we saw him have a lot of success with under Mike Patton, quite honestly. I don't know that the off zone coverage and playing an extremely, um, softer style of defense where you have to come up and, and tackle every play is playing to the advantage of these players either. It's not the strongest tackling group. You've got an undersized Darnell Savage. Amos isn't the biggest guy in the world. Jair's smaller. Like you don't have these big, you know, Cam Chancellor hitters on the back end of your defense, making them come up play after play after play and keep everything in front of them and make sure that they're not missing tackles. I'm not sure that you're playing to the strength of this team. And then Razul Douglas, he's a boundary corner. He's an outside corner. He hasn't fit very well so far in the slot. I think he can make that work. I, I think he can make it work a lot better than he has so far. But that is another thing where like in obvious passing situations, Jair needs to be in the slot. Razul needs to be on the outside. We're five weeks in. It's very clear to see, and it shouldn't be that difficult at this point. So I would say putting you know players in a position to succeed also hasn't worked out very well. How about learning from mistakes? Week one, major issue a year ago. Team came out totally flat, didn't come prepared, didn't come to show up to play at all. Surely week one in this season would not be the same. They're going to a division rival in Minnesota. This is a huge game. Could ultimately decide the NFC North at the end of the year. That's a legitimate possibility. And Green Bay no-shows again for the second straight season. How about travel? The West Coast games have given Green Bay nightmares. Like it has not gone well. So, all right, we're going to handle London differently. They... They're, by the second half, they have no energy. They don't show any passion or intensity in that second half to go out and get a win versus the Giants. Once again, traveling a long distance, they haven't learned from that mistake. Forgetting about Aaron Jones, that's something we hear about like once every, I don't know, four to six weeks where like, yeah, we got to get Aaron more involved. And then, you know, what happens? They get him extremely involved for a couple weeks. And then it's like, yeah, you know, we didn't, we didn't get Aaron involved enough. Enough, like learn from your mistake. Make sure Aaron Jones is involved in literally every single game. That should not be hard. It, it, like Matt LaFleur was asked if like outside of the building, if Aaron Jones gets enough respect. And he's like, you know, he made the answer of, well, I don't know what's said about him outside of the building, but inside the building, we have nothing but the utmost respect. We think he's the most talented, best player, best guy, etc. Then treat him as such. Make sure that he has at minimum 20 touches per game. That That should be the minimum for Aaron Jones going into any given get, you know game. And it shouldn't be much more than that. Like there, there should be a 20 to 26 touch window for Aaron Jones. That should be the window. And he should hit that every single game. First half timeouts. How I don't know how many more times that this has to be a thing. We actually had first half timeouts. We actually saw it this last week. And it was beautiful. They were actually able to go. Now they didn't use them great because, you know, well, they haven't exactly been in that scenario in the past, but uh, it was great to see them have timeouts at the end of the half. And that's been an issue, a constant issue. They used another timeout in the second half that cost them uh, a real chance to go down and score at the end of that game because they used a, a timeout early, but you know, before the end of the, the end of the game where they needed those three timeouts, they only had two. That's something that has to get cleaned up. It hasn't been cleaned up throughout the entirety of Matt LaFleur's tenure in Green Bay. How about dealing with press man? Todd Bowles in Tampa uh, showed in the second half that this is going to be an issue, that Green Bay is going to have to deal with press man coverage. They, they made that beautiful adjustment in the second half, you know, shut out Green Bay's offense. 
And then what happens against Wing Martindale? They do the same thing in the second half against Green Bay, and Green Bay has no answer for it and can't put points on the board. Like They have to do a better job of learning from their mistakes. How about game planning? All right, you want to play a you know, umbrella defense, two safeties, you know, coverage on the back, etc. That's fine. And against Patrick Mahomes and, you know, Josh Allen and, you know, the, the top tier quarterbacks in the league, I get it. I really, really do. I would do the exact same thing. But if it's Daniel Jones and Bailey Zappi with limited wide receivers on the outside, then like you have to evaluate from a game planning standpoint, what's the biggest risk of getting beat? Against Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes and the best quarterbacks in the league, your biggest risk of getting beat is by allowing explosive plays to these ultra talented quarterbacks and having them not have to go the length of the field. And, you know, all of a sudden you're, you know, allowing 28, 35, 42 points in the game. So you've got to make sure that that umbrella is over the top, that you're not giving those explosives and that they have to earn every single yard down the field. That's the right overall philosophy. Against Daniel Jones and Bailey Zappi, your bigger threat of losing one of those games is that they play a ball control offense. They run through their running backs. They, everything runs, uh, you know, more West Coast offense, dink and dunk, thousand paper cuts. You allow them to stay in the game and they actually gain some momentum because you're not challenging them enough. You know, you're, you're less, you're, you're, the lesser of your threats is their wide receivers against your corners on the outside playing aggressive with a safety over the top to try to at least limit some potential explosive plays if it does get to that point. The the bigger threat is allowing them to stay in the game and get the and keep the clock moving and keep the offense off the field. You have the better offense. Like if you get into a shootout, that should be an okay thing. And and I know Green Bay's offense isn't like made up for that right now, but your offense is better than New York's is. Like that that should be very clear. And you know, they, they, and same thing with Bailey Zappi, like they're playing the off coverage and they're not being aggressive enough. Like the bigger threat in that game, they did not neutralize. And that is a issue. They have to do a better job game planning. Like they, same thing against the, the Patriots. It was easy to see that they loaded the box against the Giants and Saquon Barkley. Where was that against the Patriots? You got to let, again, Bailey Zappi beat you with his arm to the outside, not Ramondre Stevenson and Damian Harris over and over and over and, and, and having them get going. And the, the inability to drop a safety in the box was inexcusable. Justin Jefferson, week one, you had all off season to prepare for Justin Jefferson all year, all off season. You know that this is going to be a pain in your butt in Justin Jefferson for the foreseeable future. You had all off season to plan for him and you've got nothing. You've got no plan B, plan C, plan D. And your plan A is like, I don't even think there was a plan. Like that's how bad it was. They have to do a better job of game planning for these situations. Responding to adversity. They're punched in the mouth versus Minnesota. They don't respond at all. Uh, the Giants, they're up 17 to three. Giants go on four straight scoring drives. How do they respond? Three and out, Giants go down and score for a fifth straight time. They're down by seven. Green Bay goes down, turnover on downs, game over. Like just a brutal job of responding to adversity. They do it great from game to game. When they lose a game, they have yet to lose two in a row, knock on wood and pray to every other football deity that you must to make sure that, you know, I'm not jinxing that. But that they've done a great job responding to adversity week to week, but in game, it has been really, really rough. And they, once again, they've had opportunities this season and they just haven't done it. Mentality. Like I want to see this team, I like to some extent, the Mike McCarthy, Hey, we're nobody's underdog. We're going to go out and, and play an intense, you know, physical brand of football. I'm not saying that was always the case in green Bay clearly, but like that's a better mentality right now. And, and, and the way that Dallas is playing right now in Dallas, Part of that's Dan Quinn. Part of that's Kellen Moore and, and the, the bright assistance that he has over there. But they're playing the brand of football that Green Bay sort of needs to play right now. And yeah, Green Bay doesn't have a Micah Parsons. I get that. But we all know they're not lacking talent on defense. This has got to be a tough-minded physical defense that responds to the challenge when need be. And an offense that, if you need two yards, is going to dictate and say, hey, I don't care if you've got eight in the box. I've got a battering ram in A.J. Dillon, one of the best running backs in football in Aaron Jones. I can get two yards. I don't, I'll get two yards. That's where it needs to be. And right now, the mentality just isn't there. And then in-game adjustments. I mentioned it before. Buccaneers and Giants both made huge second half adjustments against Green Bay. And it took way too long. In fact, I would even argue that it, it never came to fruition where Green Bay made a meaningful adjustment to counter punch and, and counterbalance things back in Green Bay's favor. That needs to be better. So 
what I'm looking at right now from a coaching standpoint is, is this team exceeding expectations? Are they meeting expectations or are they well below expectations? And right now for me, this team is well below the expectations that I would have had for them through five weeks. Is it a you know curse or a death kneel going forward? No, they can still respond to this. I still think they have a really strong season ahead of them. As I mentioned at the onset, I have a ton, and I mean a ton of faith in Matt LaFleur. He's going to be just fine and he's going to learn from some of these mistakes. I really truly believe that. But through five weeks, it hasn't been good enough. And we've saw, you know, we talk about good coaching. What does coach, good coaching look like? More often than not, it's like the Wink Martindale and Brian Dable taking, you know, unknown pieces on a Giants team and making them successful. But like, I know Phil Jackson, the, the NBA coach, you know, coached the Bulls and the Lakers famously. He always gets a lot of crap because, you know, he got all his rings with Jordan and Pippen, and then he got all his rings with with Kobe and Shaq. And I'm not saying Green Bay went into this season as like the the favorites to win the Super Bowl or anything. So I'm not making an apples to apples comparison. But the thing I love about Phil and what he did is that like every year going to every season for NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball, college basketball, college football, NFL, whatever you, any sport, doesn't matter. And pick the team that has the most talent every year. And see how many times they actually win the championship. Like go into the season and say like, all right, this team has the, the most talent. And then go throughout the season and say, all right, how many times did they actually win the championship? Phil took the talent with a ton of drama. Go watch The Last Dance. And you, you don't even need to look up the drama that was in LA between Shaq and Kobe. A ton of drama. Yeah, they had a ridiculous amount of talent and some of the best, greatest players of all time. But those teams don't always win. And he found a way to meld those things together to make sure that they were successful. So whether it's a coach that's getting the most out of the players that aren't very good, like Brian Dable and Wink Martindale this past week, or whether it's a Phil Jackson making sure that his star players are achieving their highest potential possible and making sure that they're coexisting, that is what good coaching consists of. And that's what we need to see more of in Green Bay that I'm fairly disappointed we haven't seen through five weeks so far. Matt LaFleur, Adam Stenovich, Joe Barry, they all need to step up. They all need to perform better. I think they can. I think they will. And I'm looking forward to seeing how Green Bay responds this week against the New York Jets. That is going to do it for me today. I appreciate you joining me. I will be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode. So please, please, please make sure to subscribe if you have not already. Tell a friend about the podcast. Hopefully they'll enjoy it as well. But that is going to do it for me today. Until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go!